Okay, let's kick off the panel. Um, this is uh, such an import important and interesting topic, the future of sports, Hollywood entertainment, and the role of celebrities uh, in investing. And uh, everybody's talking about the merging of the worlds, Hollywood and Silicon Valley are now uh, bridging a lot of in interesting opportunities together. So today uh, we wanna talk about uh, the perspectives from uh, team owners, from people who have created platforms and communities, and also the role of diversity and inclusion in the world of sports and entertainment. And with that, I would like to jump right into introducing our panel. My name is Rebecca Huang. Uh, I'm the Managing Director of Calais Ventures, and I'm here with my co-moderator, Annika. Hi, I'm Annika. I'm technically a filmmaker and storyteller. I do, however, come with a bit of a background in journalism and research as well. And we'd like to ask our panelists to give a brief introduction about yourselves. Um, Julie, would you like to start? Sure. And first, thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Julie Ehrman. I am co-founder and president of Angel City Football Club, which is a women's professional soccer team here based in Los Angeles as part of the National Women's Soccer League. We joined the league as the 12th expansion team last year and had our inaugural season. Um, and really built the club differently. We built the club um, to be an, an organization where mission and capital could coexist, where everything we did was to have a positive impact in the community, but also drive revenue because ultimately we want to be profitable. And we've done it with the mindset of being a global brand so that we can drive the most attention, awareness, and impact for women's sports and these incredible athletes. Um, it resulted in some incredible wins for us this past year. We um, played at the Bank of California that had 22,000 seats. We sold out four times. We had over 16,000 season ticket holders. Um, we generated over eight figures in sponsorship revenue, uh, merch revenue, and um, really were able to prove that if you invest in women's sports, there is actually a return, both for our community, but also for our investors. Wow, that's fantastic. Tracy, uh, please uh, share some more information about your background and the wonderful platform and community you have created. Thank you so much. Um, it is such a pleasure to be here and honored uh, to participate. So thank you. My name is Tracy DeForge. I am the founder and CEO of The Players Impact. By background, I'm an attorney by training, been in the sports industry for my entire career, working for two of the major leagues. Um, started in venture capital back in the early 2000s. Uh, so I've been building, buying, selling, investing in companies for um, over a quarter of a decade, uh, a century rather. <laughs> um, the Players Impact is a professional organization for professional athletes, active, retired, Olympic level. And what we're doing is really democratizing venture uh, in a way that starts with education. Everything we do is education about empowering athletes in business. In this way, we're we're able to not only empower the athlete as the individual, uh, as you know, the landscape is changing and that's part of the topic today. Athletes are participating more and getting more involved and in how are they leveraging their brand? But what um, we saw as lacking was the education around how do you get into these types of deals? What does it mean to be in part of these deals? What does an equity position mean? And how do you evaluate that? Uh, so truly democratizing, very mission-based, as, as Julie mentioned hers, is we're very mission-based to democratize the opportunities. Our 10-year NFL veterans, uh, they can get into these types of deals. They can access it with very large check sizes. And what we do is allow our female athletes or our Olympians, for example, uh, to write smaller check sizes, mitigating risk, and allowing them the same access um, by way of the way our syndicate platform uh, investing. We've made over 40 investments, invested over $17 million as a group, as a collective, um, and really making an impact for these athletes. And the next chapter for the athletes uh, is one of the themes that we're going to be discussing today. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm from Argentina and uh, a lot of discussions about the next chapter for Lionel Messi after the World Cup. Uh, we know he's also getting her, his um, feet wet with uh, investing and, and private equity uh, funds. And so we see this trend with uh, celebrities and athletes uh, in being curious, becoming curious about other opportunities other career choices after their athletic career is over and uh, the role of technology uh, in, in that process. We would love to discuss today. 
Larry, uh, you're here, you're a team owner. So tell us a little bit more about your journey into becoming <laughs> involved with this team. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, my name is Larry Kangas and um, uh, we, started, we started Cape Town Tigers basketball team uh, with the sole aim of getting into the Basketball Africa League, which is an NBA founded African basketball league, um, continental wide basketball league, which currently works in a very similar than, than Champions League in football, uh, that national champions uh, compete against each other on, on, on um, different conferences, first uh, provincial, um, or I mean, first the, the district championships and then the, then the provinces and then um, uh, the, the conferences and then ultimately getting to the final BAL, which is the NBA sponsored uh, league. And um, we, we really disrupted the situation because um, we were the first um, corporation. Um, you know, many of the, many of the clubs um, around the world, especially in Africa, especially in Europe, um, Latin America, I believe also, um, Asia as well, really just exclusive of United States. Um, are, are actually association based. They're not corporations. So we, we disrupted that and built it as a corporation. And I think we'd be a little bit more efficient than everybody else. Therefore, in three years, we've got two national championships. And this year we even won the, the provincial, the Eastern province of the entire African continent. And um, we are now heading into our second BAL finals. So, um, yeah, I think we'll be more competitive. And that's our story, really, in a very short period of time. Thank you, Larry. That is wonderful. And we have um, our next speaker as well. Jaroslav Kozlevski um, is joining us as well. Would you mind introducing yourself, Jaroslav? Of course. Uh, can you hear me well? We can, yes. Thank you. Perfect. So my name is Jarosław Kuleski. I'm from Poland. Um, I am doing research work in the one of the biggest Polish technological university. Also, I have like the AI company. Uh, and as a passion, I have the football club. So I am owner the one of the biggest, the most titled and the oldest Polish football club with 5 million fans in Europe. And this is my main occupation. Of course, I am uh, very, you know, love it with AI. So I really believe in artificial intelligence and human hybrid. So waiting for that. Fantastic. So Annika, would you like to kick off the first question for our panelists? Yes, absolutely. Um, we have Mark Cuban saying things like nobody throws a parade for Facebook, right? But for <laughs> winning um, a game, people do. So it brings communities together. Do you want to talk a little bit about the community impact of what you guys do? Maybe we'll set with Julie. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's important. Look, community is the most important thing because at the end of the day, you want your fans to show up whether you win or lose. In order to get the community to buy in and to care about your club, for us, it was really leading with purpose. It's explaining why we exist and why you should be a part of it. And it was building a club that set higher expectations on and off the pitch. How do we elevate the game of football? How do we elevate these female athletes? And how do we have a positive impact in our community to provide access to young girls, non-binary girls and youths so that they believe that one day they can be professional athletes. Um, we did this by starting with the community. We worked with the community as we identified our colors and our crest and we figured out which organizations we wanted to support. Um, and I believe we built one of the most, if not the most diverse and inclusive communities in all of football, certainly in the US. There is a joy to our games where our fans really wanna come and support these players and stay long after the game is over. Um, and that's because they believe in our mission. Um, when we launched Angel City, as I mentioned, we wanted to build an organization where mission and capital could coexist. So every single thing we do has some element of purpose. We never sacrifice for per per profit and we never sacrifice profit for per purpose. One great example of that is we launched the Angel City sponsorship model, where 10% of all of our sponsorship dollars goes back into the community through our social impact platform of equity, essentials, and education. So for 2022, our inaugural season, over a million dollars went back into the community. We supported over 27 organizations and really tried to lean in to make our community in Los Angeles a better place. And we're going to be building upon that this year. But it's those initiatives 
and it's really understanding what our community needs and how to show up with them, which creates that bond. So they will show up for parades if we win the match, but more than anything, will show up, you know, six hours before a game starts to celebrate with their, their friends and family and then go into the match and make one of the best experiences in women's football in the U.S. occur. Yeah, that's incredible. And when um, Argentina won the World Cup, five million people went, were in the streets and the parade was absolutely incredible. And the power of that community, the power of that inspiration in sports is really unparalleled. Uh, but Tracy, you know, talking about community, there's also another community, which is the community of the athletes themselves. Uh, when they are in the team, uh, there's this camaraderie and then they, they retire and the miss, there is a gap, there's a hole uh, on, on that community uh, and fraternity. And so let me ask about uh, the, the community that uh, your organization is creating for the athletes uh, once uh, they're thinking about the, the next chapter. Yeah, thank you. I, it, it is all about community, as Julie said. We started with the idea that you're right, that locker room environment that the athletes were missing once they were off the field or off the off the ice, et cetera. Um, and really what we saw is that there was a lot of identity crisis for our athletes as they weren't sure what the next step was for them because they spent so many hours and so many years focused on their craft and becoming great at their game that they really weren't sure what was next for them. They didn't have the time necessarily to focus on that second half. Um, so that's really where community becomes so valuable for us. It was about building an environment of trust and one that uh, athletes felt comfortable being vulnerable in, right? They, they're leaving at the top of their game, their professional level, they're the one percenters in the world, uh, but they don't necessarily know what's next. And so putting them amongst the same like-minded, high-achieving individuals that also understand what they're going through makes them feel more supported gives them more opportunity. And what is, I think, amazing about our community, first, they're they're made up of the most brilliant, um, resilient athletes in the world, but they are also uh, supportive of each other. So we're cross sport. We represent 27 different sports on our roster of athletes. And, and so you're really getting different viewpoints. Um, and because often athletes are very siloed inside of their players' organizations and, and their sport. And this really gives them the ability to network across sport. Um, but we also bring a layer of thought leaders and subject matter experts to their benefit. So community is everything for us. Across sports and also across genders, right? Because usually we we have this uh, separation between genders and sports. And what I love about what you do, Tracy, is that now we have uh, this very diverse and inclusive uh, environment for all of them to learn and uh, be able to educate themselves on investment opportunities. Now, that, continuing with the theme of community, the audience, uh, now it's also, <clears throat> excuse me, a change in the way they consume the entertainment of sport. And so I wanted to ask uh, Larry and Jaroslaw, how do you see the role of technology as we see AI, VR, we see the metaverse, and there are a lot of new developments also during the sports real time that are able to tell us when there's an offside or there's, uh, you know, technology has played a, a much uh, increased or increased role uh, in the consumption and production of the sports as an entertainment product. So what, what's your outlook on the future uh, of uh, the sports entertainment field? I, I think I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be disrupted, uh, frankly. If, there's, if there was a point I was making earlier about the, being a corporation compared to associations, I am, also making a point that um, not only the digital, but if you, you need to think about the community, who are the fans? I'm person, I'm a Finn. I, I was born and raised in Helsinki and, and then I've lived 30 years in Africa. So that's my identity. But what's also my identity is that, that I'm an HJK Helsinki fan. And that was taught to me by my uncle. And, and I know Yaroslav can e elaborate on Wisła Krakow. I mean, you have two, three generations, four generations of being fans. So it becomes, it actually means that you, it's part of your identity. You, you can't replace it. You'll never be, win or lose, you will never be in another club. That's part of your identity, that being a fan. And, and um, if, you, if you think about like, what does that mean then when we have the ongoing digital disruption into this fan engagement. Now, if you are able to, and, and I have to 
highlight something that that's what my software company is doing. If you are able to capture those feelings into the game itself, 24 seven, not 24 seven, but during the stream, during when you are with the players and with the team, if you're able to capture that, you are talking about a new industry, new, new industry of, of business because endorsements are fundamentally there because they want to be part of, the, of, the, of that being a fan of Man United, Wisła Krakow or, or Borussia Dortmund or Cape Town Tigers. The sponsors come to us, give us money because they want to be associated with that, that fan feeling, that feeling of identity. Now, if you can make that digital, then we're talking about an entire disruption of endorsement. How do the, how do the endorsement business works? So mm. I think very huge no, issue. Great collaboration, Larry. If, if, yeah. if you just create something like that, I, am the, I will be your first client. So I totally agree with you. You know that the fan experience, real time, of course, supported by AI and, and other amazing technologies like the metaverse and something like that will be crucial. You need to know what is amazing and very magic, for example, in the sport and definitely in the football. Just imagine that on this stadium, when you have like the performance, you have like, for example, 50,000 of the people. And just imagine for that moment, everybody is equal. You know, no matter you are like the lawyer, you are like the worker, physical worker, you are like the, some other uh, scientist or something like that. On the two hours, you are like the, in the completely different world where everybody is equal with quite authentic emotions. And this is very hard, you know, to find anything which is authentic, uh, uh, not homogeneous right now in the world. And there you have like the real emotions. I'm not talking about the commercial things like the, you know, buying experience, moment experience, you know, that we are buying because of the emotions or you are taking the credit because of the emotions for another match. But I'm talking about a completely different level, how we should treat as the fans, as the communities. I will give you the example. When I was taking over the Viswa, looking at the world, Viswa, four years ago, it was completely bankrupt. What we made at the first days, we create like the crowdfunding action and just imagine that the Viswa has uh, probably the largest numbers of the shareholders today in Europe as a club. We have almost 20,000 people who are like the shareholders of the club and they bought the shares of the club with a high valuation in one day, in 24 hours. You know, 20,000 people, like the businessmen, journalists, the, uh, you know, normal, like the average guys and something like that. And they are like the providing what is amazing to the private company uh, they own money because they are fun, like the Larry mentioned. This is something which is quite, you know, about the generation, about the future, about some behavior, some, you know, I think that the being in the group is, is making you much more stronger, much more equal. So, for example, where we run a uh, new strategy of the Viswa, we created like the uh, uh, team for the girls, for the women, for the people who has like the problems with uh, physical, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, some, uh, you know, diseases and something like that. So we have a lot of different other places because the sport is so authentic right now that through the sport you can address a lot of different segments of the people like the, as I mentioned lawyers different segments and you are capturing these people and the feelings in the moment of losing and winning so you can just impact in the emotions in the end of the day. Thank you, Yaroslav. We really appreciate um, all of your answers. And luckily, finally, our last speaker for today has joined, Royce Clayton. You, um, we would love to hear an introduction from you as well, but you are a professional athlete. Once you've introduced yourself, I'd love to direct the next question directly to you. Talk to us about becoming your own CEO, your own brand after sport. Hi, I'm sorry for my tardiness. Had a little trouble getting on this morning. Um, Royce Clayton, 17 years, Major League Baseball. Uh, played for 11 different teams over that uh, time span, <clears throat> was an all-star World Series champion. And uh, to answer your question about building the brand, uh, I've always believed that you're constantly building your brand. It's not after your career. So I looked at it as the relationships you build, the relationships that I've built uh, during my career, uh, socially, uh, reputation, uh, relationships within the organizations you you, you play for, uh, relationships uh, versus uh, ownership with corporate events. Uh, all these things are, are building your brand in the community. Uh, so there's so many different facets that come with it. But uh, I always say you're constantly building your brand, you're building your reputation, 
uh, as your career progresses. And it's important that these young people understand that. So it's not the last, the last game that you play, you say, okay, now it's time for me to start to get ready uh, to uh, prepare myself for off the field, for getting my career straight uh, after retirement, uh, and then start building your brand. Uh, like I said, you're constantly doing that. And I think young people need to understand that. And Royce, you know, your brand is part of your personal business model. And uh, we talked about the role of uh, technology and its uh, disruptive effect potentially in the consumption of entertainment and sports. But also we see now uh, in on this panel a lot of new ideas and models on how to create revenue. We also see uh, crossover in terms of who's investing in sports and owning teams, as well as celebrities and, uh, and athletes coming into the world of technology and creating their portfolios as well. When Warren Buffett says, you know, we have to invest in the things that we know. <laughs> and now we see all of these uh, newcomers on both fields. Uh, what do you think about the future uh, of investing and new business models that you were observing in the field? Um, are we making, creating a, a situation where we'll make a lot of mistakes. Uh, let's start with uh, Julie, please. I mean, I think you're seeing um, different types of owners enter sports. It used to be large families or um, private equity. Angel City is sort of unique in the relation to what Lars said, which is we approach Angel City as a startup. Um, so we went out and found a controlling owner and then have been raising money as we hit certain milestones. So April of 21, we completed our Series A round of financing, um, and we want to sort of lean into our growth. And as we try to expand Angel City beyond just football or beyond the U.S., we want to think about how do we leverage that brand, and then we'll bring in new investors as we go about that. Um, our investors, we think differently about, too. It's not just about the money. We recognize that Angel City is a platform, and we want to leverage other people's platforms to bring as much attention and awareness to what it is we're building. Celebrities and athletes have incredibly large platforms. They understand how to utilize those platforms and they have a direct connection with their audience. We believe fandom today has changed where fans really follow players first, then teams and leagues. So if we have the ability to lean into those platforms and make people aware of Angel City, then we have the ability to convert them into fans, hopefully ticket holders or people that buy merch and, and people that want to evangelize our stories. So our ownership group is actually the largest majority female ownership group in all of sports. Um, we have nearly 99 owners. They span celebrities and athletes. We have 14 former U.S. women's national team athletes. Um, one of my founding partners is Natalie Portman, the actress and activist. And as we continue to fundraise, we look for not only strategic money and financial money that can help us grow because they have experience in that certain vertical, but also those that understand how we're trying to build this differently, leading with mission and want to leverage their platform to build as much attention and awareness for us. So I would say that just the makeup of an investor and Tracy's built a whole business around this has fundamentally changed, right? I know how to monetize fans. I know how to build something special, but I want to leverage those who really believe in what we're doing to be part of the story. And we have found such incredible success with celebrities and athletes who understand what we're trying to build and to Royce's point, like want to be a part of it, like want to continue to build on their own legacy and also grow it for the next generation. And on that note, you know, Tracy and Royce, um, you talked about the finding of a new identity. This is not just a business model. It's not that just about making money and revenue and a livelihood, but it's really about finding that place in the world. And so how do we make these identities and these brands unique? Now, when more people are getting into these uh, new opportunities, um, how do you differentiate yourself as a good investor, as a good um, uh, brand that, that is very much uh, you and, and not like, you know, the hundreds of others that you're educating to be also in the field? So maybe, uh, Tracy, you can start with an answer. And Royce, I would love to hear your perspective uh, with your personal story, too. Okay. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I... To us, it all comes down to education. Being educated on the landscape, you're making less mistakes, mitigating your risk, diversifying what you're investing in. That's the premise of investing and being a good investor. I think when it comes to the athletes, 
what they need to know about when they're using and leveraging their brand is they can't do too much. They can't overextend themselves because then they look like a NASCAR, right? Like with all of the logos on them and then the authenticity is lost, right? So what I think that um, our community does really well is, is invest around their passions. What are they interested in? How do they do it? There's there's a, a reason to invest for a great return on your investment. And there's always those great investments that you want to put your money into. But what we're talking about here is leveraging who you are and your communities, your smaller communities, micro influencers, if you will, to make a difference and make an impact. And being authentic about that is really the only way I think that it works. And Royce, uh, that authenticity in your personal journey, could you share a little bit more about how it was for you? Yeah, I was able to um, really reflect on a way to further expand the, the brand of the player. So when I retired, I thought about what is it that I could actually do that could impact the market. So I looked, I looked at music and sports and trying to combine the two. So I started a company called Music Locker. And in baseball, we have what's called walk-up music. So when I thought about that, I said, well, here's the intersection to monetize two separate entities that can really push both both brand of the player and the entertainer. So I went to Major League Baseball Players Association, established a license that didn't exist in the marketplace for music. They looked at me like I was crazy, but I established the IP for music and really kind of dove into the music world to intersect the two. So I knew that combining uh, the player's identity and the musician's identity is you have a, a mutual interest in the player and the musician. And the brands could really just explode collectively. And um, it was unique. Uh, it was natural. It was something that the player was already doing and that obviously the artists were doing and you just intersected the two worlds. And uh, just unique situations like that, bringing that to the marketplace, like we said, and we're talking about something organic, something that naturally happens that interfaces with the two fans, uh, really grows the brand. So I was able to do that through Music Locker. I love that concept so much. We are unfortunately running out of time, but I have a very quick question uh, for Larry and Jaroslaw. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in Hollywood, we joke that if you want to become a millionaire the fastest way possible, you bring a billionaire to Hollywood and make them invest in films. <laughs> so uh, I think the same joke applies to owning teams, teams, uh, sport teams, sports teams. And so do you think it's a good investment to invest in, in teams these days? I, I, well, personally, of course, um, we have been a success, uh, but two points. Um, one, I'd have to say that we are surfing. I, as much as I'd love to take credit for everything, that we, we, our success story, um, we are surfing uh, a wave of African renaissance. And, and, and I can say I can completely relate with what Royce is saying that, it's, you know, you can see former athletes, African based athletes are returning and investing. That said, I want to highlight one point, and that was my first point. Good business practices, fundamentals, get them right, and then it's possible to invest into you. That's it. Great. 20 seconds for Jaros now to um, give your answer, and we'll have yeah, to Yeah, uh, de definitely, you know, in, term, in terms of the intellectual progress, uh, which you can get, you know, investing in the club is something really amazing. You are feeling com completely different the world and the needs uh, about your you know <clears throat> place in the world etc so i i think that the investing in sport is investing of, of course because of the reasons which are connected to the money but another one is to trying to de develop ourselves and i really believe in the future thanks to ai metaverse uh, football sport will be controlled also by fans in some case so we will be also everybody will you know take part in the experiment so thank you very much Thank you to all of our panelists. We could go on for another hour. We have so many more questions. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. We want to thank you all again. It was a wonderful panel. Thank you for being with us this morning. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you.